Hello and welcome to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event. My name is Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director for Movers and Shakers. I hope you're all having a really good Tuesday. So welcome to our members and also to our newcomers. And for those of you who don't know Movers and Shakers, we're in our 25th year, uh, 25 years of bringing together key players from the public and private sector, local authority, governments, combined with developers, investors, surveyors, lawyers, architects, bringing people together to create great products um, and the great built environment. And also we're really proud of our events of bringing together the right speakers that are really content driven. And obviously we've been doing a series of virtual events at the moment. So I hope you've all been enjoying these. And if you've missed any of our virtual events, do go on to our YouTube channel and do take a look and do subscribe because they're all there. So today, today is our first webinar in a series of three international sessions on livability, capturing and accelerating the positive changes in behavior from the COVID-19 experience. So the subject today is localities and livability. So we're really looking at community driven neighborhoods. And today we welcome a great array of speakers from across the globe. So first of all, welcome to Jeff Rism, who is the Chief Innovation Officer, live from Copenhagen from Gale Architects, Blaise Backer. And our Blaise is of the Small Business Department Deputy Commissioner in New York, so live from New York. And from the UK, from London, we have Stella Canoe. And Stella is Executive Director for Lyft, the, uh, the, the actual in, um, International Festival for Theatre in London. And we also have Tim Stoner, and he is Managing Director and Owner of Space Syntex. And our great chair today, good friend of Movers and Shakers, we welcome Patricia Brown, who is Director at Central. And today's event is in association with Patricia's great initiative, London 3.0, and we'll email you more information on that later. So thank you so much to all our contributors for coming together today from across the globe. So from Copenhagen, London and New York, our speakers are coming together to look at how we shape successful neighbourhoods that are driven by communities and by people. And we've obviously seen some really positive changes uh, from COVID-19 in terms of things like the environment, air quality, in terms of people choosing sustainable transport modes. And people seem to be enjoying their local spaces in a totally different way. And it's really brought a prominence to public realm, to design, to space. The absence of culture has shown people how important culture is to well-being, And it's shown us that we really need to look from the ground up, but have true leadership to bring this forward. And we obviously want to translate tactical changes to permanent measures on a long-term basis. So really fascinated to hear the ideas of our panel today. So as I said, Patricia will facilitate this. Uh, there will be a chance for you to all to ask questions. There's a Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. So please do, do ask some questions. Our panel will be showing slides. So thank you very much, enjoy, and over to you, Pat and the panel. Thank you very much, Lee. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, the audience here today, and also the, uh, the fantastic speakers, which Lee has already outlined. Now, Lee has also talked about some of the things that have been beneficial um, in this terrible situation we find ourselves. The focus on the local, the focus on better air quality and more, um, the opportunity for what we and many other people have been uh, promoting for quite some time around tactical urbanism, reshaping our streets and spaces for people. And this was a subject that, of, um, of a webinar that we did back in April, which was looking at this new, new world, new order, and how did we actually start to think of the different aspects of London and, and cities, not just in London, but towns and places across the UK and across the world to give them back to people. And those of you who were on the webinar might have heard, uh, you would have heard me say that I was channeling my inner Winston Churchill at that point and saying that you sh we should never let a good crisis go to waste. And because this is focusing people's minds, they have actually, um, it has engendered behavior change. It's got people out of their cars and onto bikes, often for the first time ever as families. And it's actually enabled people to take over the street um, 
to, to walk down, to cycle down, to sit in, um, in, in the name of social distancing. So it's a terrible um, uh, situation with lots of uh, loss of life and we would not wish this on, on us ourselves in any way, shape or form. But there has been positives. And as Lee said, a lot of that positive is about thinking about neighborhoods and, and how we um, use our neighborhoods and create, take the benefits of being local, whether that's in our shopping environments or just being able to walk in our local park that we didn't even know was possibly five minutes down the road from us. So discovering our place. Now, many of us who think about cities have been thinking about those for a long time and trying to uh, consider the notion of um, what planning people like Peter, Peter Hall call uh, polycentric cities. Paris call this the 15 minute city. How do you create neighborhoods that are providing everything that you need to live a life well? And that is ultimately the basis of my initiative, London 3.0 to rethink how do we create a London that takes into account what we need to be a strong economy, a world city that will continue to move forward, but enable Londoners to live in a just world, a just city, and to live a life well by understanding the facilities and the needs of um, the facilities those people need to connect them into um, the, the, the best possible life. But those local facilities have to connect into um, a bigger spectrum and that's what this series is about, is taking the local and moving it up to city level, which will be the, the, the second in the series. But today, as we've already heard from Lee, is today is all about the local and the neighbourhoods. And we've got some fantastic speakers and I'm going to get on uh, and let them speak now because that's why you're here, not to hear from me. Um, First off, I'd like to um, introduce Jeff Reeslam, who is, um, as we've already heard from Gale Architects. Now, the word, the name Jan Gale, for most people who are involved in city shaping, um, doesn't need any introduction. And Jan and his eponymous um, company, uh, Gale Architects, have had their fingerprints on, on cities and places all around the globe including London. And um, my former organisation, Central London Partnership, along with Transport for London, commissioned one of the Gale Architects major studies in 2003 for public life, public space. And when we published it, Stuart Lip Sir Stuart Lipton, the property guru, said at the launch, this feels like a game changer for London. Um, it was a really important moment in time when we thought started to think differently, think small incrementally, but differently about um, a planning for movement for people. And I'm, I'm very, therefore, incredibly delighted that we have got one of his um, luminaries in, in the Gale stable to speak to us today about just some of the work that they have been doing um, in this new world, new order. Uh, and over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Pat. Um, a real pleasure to be um, beaming in here from a slightly dark room in Copenhagen. Um, what I want to try to do is actually give you all a bit of the picture of what it looks like on the ground here in Copenhagen and in Denmark in general, and put that in the context that uh, Pat and Lee so, so nicely set for us so far. So in Denmark, um, we have this sort of current situation related to COVID. Um, we're pretty far along in the reopening. Um, already schools for young kids uh, opened already in mid-April and stores and restaurants already in mid-May. So we're about two months in to this sort of new, uh, new normal that, you'd, that, we're, uh, exp that we're sort of making up as we go along. Uh, but the good thing is that um, cases continue to stay relatively low. And so I have to admit that life feels, uh, feels quite normal. We know that, you know, this is, Lee and Pat have mentioned this about this, well, are, what, are, what is happening now that we might wanna bring with us? And I think at Gale and in general, the work that I wanna show today is about, well, can we quantify some of this observed behavior? And so, 
what we did is not long after everything locked down is we said, well, let's go out and let's actually measure and map what people are doing when everything's closed. How is the city serving basic needs when it's really only the basic things that people can use the city for? So we collected uh, a lot of data there uh, in the early April. And then after things began to open up again, we went out and said, uh, again, can we collect info to find out, well, what's happening now? How are things bouncing back? So we use this tool that we've created that has a standardized um, data protocol. And so it's easy for us to compare not only to these conditions in Copenhagen, but from other cities around the world that we've collected similar data. And so right off the bat, unsurprisingly, of course, city centers, Copenhagen uh, as well, were really, really badly hit, right? There was 60, 85% fewer pedestrians in the, in, the, in the center, but we saw that as we moved uh, away from downtown, and this was true of other Danish cities as well, um, the amount of life and activity was actually greater than typically, um, as you can imagine, because people were spending more time at home. But now two months in, uh, we can in many ways say that uh, the city center is back. If you know Copenhagen, this looks like a outskirts of town, but this is, this is right in the heart of the center, uh, uh, heart of the city. And there's um, plenty of life and activity, like I know there has also been in several London parks. But again, this idea of quantifying it. And so what we see here is actually the population of the city has sort of flattened uh, their own curve of, of life. Uh, you see the before activity with peaks of use right around lunchtime, say in some walking streets like the Copenhagen main walking street, which was completely dead during the lockdown. That's the blue line. And now we see this sort of revitalized, opened up uh, city. And we have almost, um, well, more people, not quite as many as before, but they're more evenly spread out throughout the course of the day. Interesting to, to wonder if that's you know on purpose or, or what's really driving that pattern. But uh, general activity is still lower than it was in, uh, in the winter. So while some areas are rejuvenated, we're definitely not back to normal just yet. One thing both Lee and Pat mentioned was this sort of re resurgence or sort of um, ex uh, people exploring uh, n n local, air local parks, schoolyards, parts of the neighborhood for maybe the first time. And we could see that actually people that were exposed to a place um, for the first time then began to go back afterwards and continue to have uh, a positive experience there and begin to think fondly about it. And even sort of new forms of public life, like this turtle walking uh, that you see here seem to be popping up in some of these local neighborhoods as well. We also see that the behavior in these local public spaces has changed. So much more play and exercise uh, than before, uh, and even more play and exercise than, than during uh, the lockdown. And again, here on the right, you just see some stats about how that activity pattern uh, afterwards is, is different um, than, than during, slightly less number of people than during, but again, the, the sentiment that people have been aware now of wonderful new local places and are using them again. The other great thing that I think we can learn from this crisis and hopefully bring with us is that we've seen a real strengthening of a sense of community. And even in places like Denmark where the Danes are relatively shy, you know, we see that people are much more likely to interact with strangers, to be friendlier now than, um, than before the lockdown. We'll see if that can, uh, if we'll see if that can continue that sort of more willingness to connect with your fellow, uh, fellow community members. We also see challenges with the new perceptions. So here, of course, we see this is a survey of a few hundred people online in the city where we can see that people feel safe um, walking and biking in Copenhagen, which they always have, but they also feel very safe in their car, which is, of course, uh, could, be a, could be a challenge while public transit is the place, the form of, uh, of, of transit where people feel uh, the least safe. So we've seen that transit perception improve uh, here after things have opened up where it's becoming more and more acceptable. But again, we have a really, uh, really big challenge there in Copenhagen and around the world. And I think it emphasizes the need for not only some of the temporary infrastructure for walking and cycling that we've seen put in, but hopefully the, the demand for it to be 
much more robust and permanent as it is uh, as it is in Copenhagen. So a very quick overview there, but I think the, the question is, well, what do we do with this information, right? Can we design uh, for this flattened curve that I mentioned, which uh, actually has a lot of benefits in terms of uh, longer use throughout the day and the week and continues to help people feel safe and healthy in spaces. Can we continue the trend of investment, uh, high quality design and, and use of our local neighborhood public spaces now that they've been sort of rediscovered uh, by the local population? And then can we also design and invite for this renewed sense of social interaction that we see so we can build on that positive sort of goodwill while also addressing real concerns about, uh, about public transit, especially, which is still very contentious. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. Um, now, the other game changer that happened in, in London um, over the past 20 odd years I, I always think, and I start my story about London 3.0, with the, the um, pedestrianisation, the idea of the pedestrianisation of Trafalgar Square, which for many of you who were too young to remember how it used to be, used to be predominantly a traffic island where it took nine minutes to cross from one side of the, the square to the other because everything was prioritised for vehicles. And, um, and Central London Partnership, my then organisation, led the lobby to make sure that went through in the face of opposition and one of the leading lights in that project was um, dear Tim Stoner who was now um, made his, his uh, name as being someone that has really helps us understand how people move around space in a, in a model in a modeling way as opposed to uh, a similar way to Gale Architects but I'm going to stop waffling and hand over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pat, and uh, hello to everyone joining this event. Um, I just knew that you were going to mention Trafalgar Square, Pat, so I thought it should be my first slide. But actually, I've made it Trafalgar Square because it taught us something back then about how to create a local place. And I think that is very much the story of how we can see COVID as as a as an opportunity you know see the silver lining in the in the awful situation and what we learned in trafalgar square was that in order to create a local place where people would feel comfortable to sit and spend time we had to connect that place into the large scale network of pedestrian movement across the central city and that's really the theme to this presentation it's about the relationship between the local and the global and before the steps were put into Trafalgar Square, people used to walk around the edges. As you said, it was easier to do that. It was more convenient. You could avoid the traffic. And we learned that by putting the steps in, we could create a shortcut. And so to create a local place, you sometimes have to create a shortcut for people just to pass through. They don't necessarily know why they should be going there. They're just passing through. So if we're thinking about how we can repurpose our cities towards local, let's not forget that we will need to irrigate them uh, into the larger scale of the city. And after all, just as for Trafalgar Square, so it is every, just about every major centre neighbourhood, local neighbourhood in London, is either right on or just next to a big street. And they're highly connected therefore to each other but also they're surrounded by a local fine grain network of walkable streets as well again it's this large scale small scale thing that we need to recognize and enhance one other feature of local centers is that you're never far from one in a great city whether it's london or whether it's milan or madrid or paris or new york or um, anywhere that's had a chance to develop over time, you're never too far from one. And you can walk from one centre to the next without quite knowing when you've left one or entered the other. There isn't, if you like, a strong boundary between them. And so, again, in thinking about local centres, we have to be careful not to over-define them. We call this the fuzzy boundary, that as you uh, see London as a city of villages, it's also a city of centres with fuzzy boundaries. Urban planning worldwide though 
defaults to over enclosed enclaves. It's the lowest common de denominator of international real estate. We fence places off, we divide them with fast highways and we're creating car dependence and obesity. So we can't just say we're gonna have a local center and then put walls around it. We have to, if you like, go back to the good lessons of the traditional connected city where the centers are on or just off the boulevards. But even if you've got that, it's almost like the professions conspire to kill the center if they can. And the guardrail, although it's no longer what it was, I mean, you're trying to work out where this is, you know, it's not London anymore, um, but it is in, in Hong Kong here. And it's almost like we've got the fine scale tissue of streets to create the center, but the traffic engineers are denying the life from happening. Switch to today, Northcott Road um, in Wandsworth and an amazing transformation of that place to uh, sitting and walking and enabling us as a result of removing the barriers that were in place before. And I just went back into Google Earth this afternoon to remind myself, this is not only a, um, a corridor dominated by vehicles, it's not only a 30 mile an hour speed limit, but it's also just worth remembering that those vehicles are doing a good job. They're letting people go to and from work, go to and from other friends and neighbors. So yes, Northcott Road today may be wonderful, but when we all do go back to work and do start using public transport, are we gonna to have to reintroduce this or is there another way of doing things? So a couple of ideas for what we might do differently. The first thing is we might, and we should, and we must reduce maximum speed limits globally from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. As, as we can say in the USA and the UK, 30s dirty and 20s plenty. It doesn't quite work when you move to the metric system, but 20s plenty, that just has to be a global default. And it's incredible and a scandal that we don't yet have it in place uh, in our country. What we've also been working on recently at Space Syntax, just to close with a couple of projects, is the concept of a soft hub, because we suspect people aren't going to go back to working in central London to the degree that they were. Um, I think the real estate of central London will have to rethink itself. And from where people are living at the edge to where they're working in the centre, there are these local neighbourhood opportunities for people to either work near where they live or just a short bike ride away. And we think that might lead to a rebalancing of London to these local neighbourhood centres that I showed earlier, whether they're along the Edgware Road or one of the other great radials of London. Places which once you can stop and change bike to walk, you might also just say, well, why bother? Why don't I just um, stop here, have a cup of coffee, do a bit of work, and actually my work is done because I'm on Zoom all day. So that might actually start to repurpose and give some life back to the high street. We've got fantastic data coming through just to sort of build on uh, what Jeff was saying. You know, apps and data are providing us with knowledge that can give the real estate credibility to the proposition of the fine connected street grid. They make money. We're really clear about that from work we've been doing in Australia, in Darwin, Melbourne and other places. And so here's my last image going forward. What we're now master planning, this is our master plan for the city of Astana in Kazakhstan, is everything we've learned that works well in the traditional centers of great historic cities. Those, those can be replicated in the cities of the future. If we have the boulevard or the main street, the major centers at the intersections of the boulevards, and then the local marketplaces and high streets coming off them at 90 degrees into the fine grain network of streets around them. And I hope those are some useful thoughts about how neighborliness is actually related to being civic at the same time. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, it was really helpful and lots of points that we can pick up in the, in the Q and A. Um, amongst all of that sort of the, the, what you've shown in North Cot Road, I imagine, you know, if, if you'd have asked local people, local traders, what they would want for that, they would have probably said, 
no, 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 you know, pedestrianisation and taking cars out will kill our local activity. And actually understanding the needs of businesses and working with them in order to help understand what is happening in, in change and engage with that is absolutely at the heart of the work that Blaise Backer does at, um, at the Department of Small Business Services. And Blaise, having been a former bid director for um, a street, a, an avenue called Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn, is that absolutely steeped in understanding what it's like to run a neighbourhood and, and manage the ecology of a neighbourhood and understands the pain of what those neighbourhood um, businesses go through. So he's absolutely the perfect person to, actually, to work on a whole series of programmes He's going to tell us a fraction of them, what's going on now in New York. Over to you, Blaze. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, as Pat uh, said, um, so the agency, just real quick context for those not familiar with uh, New York City or our government, uh, the agency I, I work in, the uh, Department of Small Business Services, we, we do everything uh, sort of uh, on the workforce development side, uh, as well as business support, and then my team where we really focus on thriving neighborhoods. Um, and what we do essentially is working with the community-based partners. So as Pat touched on, not only our business improvement district network, which is 76 bids uh, and, and growing, but also a network of other community-based organizations and merchants associations, um, and really supporting them and empowering them and really listening to them when it comes to what works for their neighborhood and, and what sort of tools and support they need from city government to do that work. Um, so what I wanted to touch on today was something which we've been supporting in cooperation with our, our city's Department of Transportation, which really you know, touches on these subjects and what, what we can do in the near term. Um, and, you know, as, as you may see in the press, while, um, while certainly, um, you know, COVID continues to uh, ravage many parts of our country right now, uh, New York City um, and New York State have, you know, have, are in the reopening process and New York City um, started uh, reopening on a, on a phase level. Uh, we, our restaurants are not yet fully open, um, but we have been experimenting with a lot of options of ensuring that we can get restaurants and, and people, of course, out onto the streets. So um, just quickly on these three programs that have kind of, again, all sort of just evolved in the last um, several weeks uh, and rolled out, um, sort of our open streets program, um, open restaurants program, and then sort of this combination of the two. Um, so just, you know, a quick overview of what they are and, and what, what we've um, done to implement them. Our open streets program really was sort of a way to, you know, get people outdoors again, really, we, you know, as much as we have some great parks and plazas in New York City, um, we really didn't have enough open space within a lot of our neighborhoods where people were working from home um, and, and given the social distancing requirements, we really needed to open up more space. So our sort of open streets, which of course means closed to vehicles, um, has allowed for a lot more um, uh, recreation um, and a lot more space for people to spread out. And um, right now, while we are uh, trying to get to about 100 miles of open, uh, open streets, right now we're about 63 miles across all five boroughs. Um, and essentially the model we've used here is, is in many cases, and, and majority cases, really working with our community-based partners organizations that my team works with and our DOT public space unit works with to ensure you have an organization very local that only, not only helped to kind of uh, decide where these, these uh, open streets would happen, but really took on ownership in terms of uh, space, you know, putting up barricades as appropriate, ensuring those barricades could be moved for, for local traffic. Um, and, and really taking on sort of that stewardship role of these spaces. Um, our open restaurants program, we open, uh, which is more recent just now, um, so again, just a few weeks now, is really taking, um, you know, it's something which we don't quite frankly have had in New York City where, where restaurants could as of right essentially set up out on either the sidewalk or on the curb lane. Um, currently, so indoor dining right now is still prohibited in New York City. Um, but we did need to find ways to, you know, as we open, as we started to reopen, really finding some new tools and ways that our restaurant sector um, could begin to um, open up and recover. And so it's just a quick um, look at sort of some of the, the guidelines we've set in place. But I mean, a key thing here, which was really new for us, was this idea of sort of self-certifying. Um, you know, we before we were looking at a lot of models where we relied entirely on our community-based partners. But given the, the speed of which the city needed to move and the volume of restaurants in our city, 
Um, we came up with this model where restaurants, you know, they really kind of a very straightforward application process online where they can, you know, self-certify in minutes and just sort of recognize that they understand the guidelines, um, what is required in terms of safety, um, and, you know, not only to protect diners from, from vehicles, but also ensure there was sort of the right distancing between tables, that there was um, accessibility, um, and, and several other sort of guidelines in place. And cer certainly, um, you know, again, while we've had um, what we uh, would call, um, you know, sidewalk cafes, which was our previous model, which certainly required a, a, a long approval process and hiring of architects and paying considerable amount of fees to the city. This is entirely free to restaurants. Uh, um, and again, we've never really had something where we actually, uh, a lot of restaurants and stuff in the curb lane um, at all times, really sort of taking away, um, you know, curbside parking. Um, and then this final uh, model, which just uh, I think rolled out now like a week and a half ago, um, is sort of a combination of the two, where essentially taking the open streets, but um, model but allowing for rest where there is sort of a cluster of restaurants to really close up uh, the entire corridor on weekends, usually a Friday to Sunday um, at the current moment. Um, and again, having our community-based organizations take the lead here and really apl uh, apply and take on sort of a stewardship role, both in closing the street and um, setting up sort of for, uh, furniture, but also uh, three or more restaurants can get together and apply um, to take this on themselves. Um, and so just to, to close on sort of where we are right now, I mean, we've had over 8,000 restaurants. I think it's about 8,200 less counts. We have them coming in every day and we have a, a uh, the DOT has put together uh, an online map showing exactly where restaurants have certified. Um, this this just the darker colors in this map show you sort of the percentage of uh, restaurants in every community district that are participating thus far. Um, and so this, well, you know, it's, you know, we have obviously a lot of uh, a lot of restaurants and bars in New York City, and we're um, and it, and I think the reality is that um, you know some some. Uh, some neighborhoods and boroughs are, are, are kind of slower to move on these types of things. So my team is taking a, where we can a proactive approach and trying to reach out to uh, businesses and neighborhoods where there is a low participation rate, ensure that there might, um, you know, that they're aware of the program, make sure there aren't any barriers in terms of language um, or sort of technology or anything else that they might need in order to ensure they can participate in the program. Um, and so, you know, we continue to um, learn from this model. We have, we've set up a weekly uh, feedback loop with uh, uh, some of our closest bid partners to ensure that we're hearing what's working, what's not working, and we can direct that feedback, um, both to our Department of Transportation as well as um, our Office of Nightlife, uh, ensure that we're uh, getting things right and, and adjusting as needed. Um, so I put two, two links here uh, in case helpful and anyone wants to uh, look a little more at what we're doing in this sector. Thanks. Thank you so much, Blaise. That was really fascinating. So I knew it would be. Now, um, my our last speaker, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you an organisation, if you do not know about it already, called the London International Festival of Theatre, otherwise known as LIFT. And I've had the privilege of actually um, knowing and working with LIFT uh, for over 25 years. I believe at one point I was a longer standing board member, um, which is an accolade I'm rather proud of. Um, and I've seen what, uh, firsthand what LIFT does in, in bringing people into, as part of their site-specific work that they do, to bring international theatre to London. They take over parts of London that sometimes you didn't even know existed, and take you by the hand and, take you and, and, and lead you to wonderful places and understand your city. And in doing so, they give us permission to look at the city in a very different way, which is what I think culture and culture-led organisations are absolutely brilliant at. And what we uh, you know, are hearing today in all of this is the importance of, of communities and community and community-based organisations in shaping this new world and taking ownership of it. And therefore, how do we help more people achieve that? So it gives me great pleasure to welcome the executive director of the London International Festival Theatre, Stella, as our last speaker. Over to you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you. I think we could probably all agree that the biggest uh, revelation for most of the globe's population has been that work, the workplace, workplace dynamics, take up too much time in our lives. 
notwithstanding kind of unsafe accommodation, violence in the home, extreme loneliness, or perhaps poverty, most of us have rediscovered our homes. We've rediscovered our home life. And also that means that we've rediscovered the kind of geographic areas that we live in. And culture has kind of been on that journey with us. It's been in our homes through our mobile phones, our TVs, our laptops, through the reading of paperbacks or audible books um, to the Spotify playlists that we're listening to. So the artists and culture have absolutely ridden this journey with us every step of the way. We have a strap line, which is that we see London as being the stage. So essentially one of the things that we do as an international festival is to bring international works of merit, of scale um, to London during usually a month in, in the year, every two years. So we're a biannual festival. And part of that uh, making London the stage means that we are able to animate some of the spaces across London that are maybe hidden or maybe just local and we dress them to be these different spaces alongside building performances, works, happenings, events inside some of London's most kind of iconic uh, buildings. What you would have seen in slide one is one of the pieces of work that kind of demonstrates how we bring the spectacular close. Um, and East Wall was a project that took place at the Tower of London with a series, a, a couple of dance uh, companies um, working uh, with the historical royal palaces to present this real spectacular um, space. So again, kind of using this outdoor space to dress it and allow huge numbers of audiences to participate in what is for many people a local space, but it's also about connecting different spaces within London. A similar project that kind of does a, a, a slightly different thing. So Night Walks with Teenagers back in our 2018 festival was really about exploring the spaces where people live. So one of the things that we do as well as running the biannual festival is that we have a really long-term partnership with just one particular locale in London, in the London borough of Haringey. And we've been working in Tottenham over the last six years in two ways. One, that when the festival happens, we use some of the locations within Tottenham to add, again, animate the space and allow local residents to kind of experience spectacular art that they wouldn't see anywhere else. And we also work with a group of young people who support us in developing some work that will be relevant for that community. With this particular piece, uh, the young people had co-produced this um, idea of walking around a, a local area. So as an audience member, you were not static, stuck in a chair. You were exploring your space for the first time, probably at night. Um, and so the idea that, again, this rediscovery that COVID has presented for a lot of residents, um, it becoming performative, becoming a shared experience. And there are all indications that although lots of people are wanting shutdown to be over, there is still going to be some coaxing out of people's homes. And culture has already had a lot of experience in terms of making the space safe just by dressing it, doing something different with it, engaging with it, and also canvassing ideas about how people feel about their space. Um, at the moment, there's lots of ambiguity about um, where people live. Most of us are in homes, some people are shielding. And the idea that there is a rediscovery of the safety of the space and how culture can drive that, this is just kind of one of those examples. So slide number three um, is a slightly different take that looks at the, the connectivity between buildings and streets. So taking it away from the kind of open spaces, the, the way that we approach culture is to connect, often we're connecting spaces. And when um, I spent some time a few years back working at the development of the Turner Contemporary space, uh, Gallery, um, which at the time was going to be this international visitor destination in a space that was a seaside town that was in decline. And so we spent a few years like building up to the preparation of the development of this space, knowing there would be international visitors and knowing that we would be opening up a space um, to way more visitors, way more numbers, millions in fact, um, as now history has kind of um, unfolded. 
And what we did was we spent a bit of time as a committee and a task force looking at the preparation, looking at the cultural buildings that had existed. And at one point we made a connection thinking about how we would get local people to find ownership of the space, ownership of this new gallery um, in a space where there wasn't a huge history of um, visual arts. And we made a connection between Theatre Royal Margate, the Winter Gardens and Turner Contemporary in a kind of triangular shape. And we used that triangular shape alongside um, the old town in the middle of Margate that was also being redeveloped with independent shops again in preparation um, but also to revitalize the space, phys the physical environment with this old town going through this imaginary triangle that we had created between those spaces and so we were finding trying to find natural navigation points that would help bring people to those locations and that we would also have moments in the year to collectively animate the space and allow culture to make things happen. I think there are huge examples where culture has been used to animate space. Um, Brixton City Festival was a recent festival that I developed in Brixton during its um, uh, during several years of gentrification and restoration of some areas that left a lot of local people feeling a lack of ownership on the space. And so again, we animated the space with activities that included um, spaces that people commonly felt um, ownership to and also revitalizing some of the community spaces and also looking at people's locality. So we did work in pubs and cafes and restaurants and as well as in the market squares, these natural spaces where town centre planning has already considered how culture can have a place within its, um, within its bounds. And I think that there, there's definitely um, lots and lots of examples that I can give, but I think that there is a, now that people were entering in the into the phase of, you know, post, post pandemic recovery, let's say, and the government in its wisdom has decided that culture cannot open with theatre buildings and spaces and all of the things that we're used to, what it can do at the moment is work outdoors and in outdoor spaces. So in some of these um, examples that I've given to demonstrate the potential, even with social distancing rules, the potential for the physical environment to help people um, to, to be an escalator of healing, to be an escalator of local people gathering together and coming back to normal, um, the end result could potentially be that people are, main, are able to maintain their real discovered love that they've had for their local their locality and their, the place that they live and work um, during shutdown. I really do believe and I really know that culture is a great driver for many, many things, both short term, short term and long term. And it's also really important to remember that when we're talking about communities, whether it's urban planning or physical spaces, you know, artists live in places. They often live <laughs> in next door to us they live in the building above they live in the building below every community is full of artists and full of creativity so the possibility remains that in recovery culture can still be a driver for change thank, thank you. you so thank you so much stella and thank you everybody that was a fascinating series of presentations and i'm so sorry stella that you were you were bedeviled by technical issues but you know you handled it beautifully um there was a big theme there and there was a there was some golden threads amongst all of that and actually your presentation especially Stella uh, reminded me of um of a, a, a talk a London 3.0 talk we did with the developer and you and I a few weeks ago um with Kwame Kwe, uh, Kwe Alma who is the um young Vic uh, artistic director and he was looking for culture on street corners and, and the role of the artist in weaving this society is going to be absolutely critical. So I want to have a bit of time for just Q&A amongst ourselves and then I'm going to invite questions from the audience. We, we don't have that much time. But what, what is coming across in, in all of your uh, respective presentations is this sense of rediscovery, rediscovery of the local and the enjoyment of that. 
And I, I was really fascinated, Jeff, by the flattening out of the curve that, that you were talking about. So our, our, our lives are lived not at peaks, but constantly throughout the day. And then with Blaze, you know, what we heard about was, we heard about community driven organizations working to make that commercial and civic space work together. And I'm just wondering, and it's a question maybe to Stella and Tim initially, leaving aside the role of the artist in this for the moment, do we have that sort of community ethos that can really help embed this new world way of working in Britain? And, you know, obviously, Jeff, you'd have a view on this and I'd be interested to know from Blaze what came first, the chicken and the egg? Tim? Do you yeah, know? I mean, I, I love, uh, it's both, isn't it? You can't separate the innate need for our species to be social and, and also then to connect physically and spatially. I mean, the, the, the city we build is a reflection of how we think and we think in terms of connections, so we build connections. Um, I love Stella's idea that you're never far from an artist because mm -hmm. I think it had an echo of the idea I put forward that in a good city, you're never far from a center. And you put those two things together, you've got creativity and locality. And, and I, you know, just one last observation, I thought the most vivid manifestation of the coronavirus response was the fact that you could see children playing in streets and chalk drawn on the pavements, on the sidewalks of our cities. It just showed that given the chance, we will flourish in the space between buildings. Thank you, Stella. And but before I ask you to come in, one of the, I wanna just mention a question that we've had from someone called Simon Pierce saying, um, and an important one, what are the challenges surrounding community driven initiatives in time and resource poor neighbourhoods? Will such an approach not increase inequality? So, you know, Stella, you probably would have a talk to that and I know Blaze and Jeff would be able to too. Could you say that question again, please? What are the challenges? So, well, first of all, I'd like you to just talk about what you think in, in, you know, in general to my question, but, but Simon Pierce has asked a relevant question which is what are the challenges surrounding community driven initiatives in time and poor resource and, and, and resource poor neighborhoods? Will such an approach not increase inequality? You know, it's a really important question. And I can go to Jeff and, and, and Blaze first if you want. You okay. have, yes, yes. I'll go to Jeff. Um, great. So I think I, what I've, I'm inspired by the idea of, I think, what was incorporated in Blaze's presentation about this idea of, you know, very practical, nimble local government sort of working hand in hand with the needs of, um, of business owners or, or people in that community. And I think that's an example of something that we can bring with us. And I think the challenge, though, is to the inclusion question is that well, you know, or how, how do we create that more constructive relationship between citizen and government uh, for more citizens, um, right? And I think, I, I think about how we need new mechanisms to connect uh, decision maker and citizen. And I think culture could be an incredible um, sort of connect, uh, a, a catalyst for that. It could also be practical, you know, this about needing to have more space to open your, your restaurant. But I think the key is to shorten, just to, you know, removing red tape, <laughs> working very practically, pragmatically, um, connecting at the everyday level with, um, with citizens. And so I think I'm, I'm just inspired by what this New York's done in that context. And I think as designers, we have to then design the system to make it easier for more citizens to have sort of that connection um to institutions whether they be cultural or municipal thank you very much back to stella and then to blaze yeah i mean i think 
I think the, 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 the question that you asked around the socialness of, particularly in Britain, I think the hero of this moment has been the humble corner shop, which in a sense has replaced the kind of the workplace, the station, um, the place of, of gathering and congregation. And that has just definitely happened at a hyper local level. And what I think this, what I think COVID has shown us though, is that we are out of habit of socializing both on a local level with intent and commitment and that also means that in this period there has been more um, connection and there has been more communication about what is happening locally and that could indicate that the next phases are people wanting to have a civic say a bit more about what is happening in their local park and and the streets and and you know there's lots of real fast particularly in my borough in Greenwich there was lots of fast reacting you know, the streets were widened within about four days of it being, is this an idea that we need to do now that we've um, relaxed lockdown? And there was lots of activity, not just in the social space, but on the street, people stopping and talking with each other and talking about the local space. So, and I definitely agree with Jeff that, you know, this disconnect that is ever present between decision makers and, and people deciding how your locality looks, the place where you live, the place where you, most of us spend half of our salaries um, making sure that we're anchored in, that that's, the decisions around the spaces are often out of, our, out of local hands, they're out of local people's hands. And there's nowhere where that shows up more than in poor neighbourhoods where the things are done, people feel that things are done to them. Um, and so for me, again, it's all about what are the opportunities in this moment? in recovery. And I think that this um, conversations like this that talk about the potential of civic change um, done collectively and done through all different manners and channels um, for the benefit of all is, is the greatest opportunity that could have come out such a tragic moment, tra such a, a period where we're uncertain and unsure. Let's get certain that we want the great things for our localities. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm really conflicted because it's so some great questions coming in. Blaze, very, uh, if you could yeah. just read from that basis. Please. Yeah, well, I definitely want to address Simon's uh, question. I think it's a good one and I, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, the city, city government can certainly have the best of intentions many times and come up with really creative and innovative interventions, particularly at moments of crisis. But I think unless we, unless we are incredibly proactive, um, not only sort of on the city government level, but, but, but again, supporting those community-based organizations in neighborhoods that are less resourced and less affluent to ensure that they, you know, not only that they have the, the resources to, to sort of take on similar actions, but in many cases, it's, I mean, it's about awareness and communication and, and meeting people where they're at. Um, and, and a lot of times that there's language barriers and cultural barriers and technology barriers. So, um, you know, I, I just to touch on a couple things, I think for us, I see it as, you know, and my team and what we do is, is hopefully to help build that infrastructure of community-based organizations, you know, before crises hit and just make that part of our strategy as a city to ensure we're investing in organizations that need resources. So, you know, currently, um, you know, we have about four point four and a half million dollars we invest uh, every year right now in low to moderate income neighborhood organizations to really ensure that we're building capacity at the local level. So not only helping them to sort of assess their neighborhoods and where they see challenges and where they see opportunities, but then hopefully help to resource them in a way that they can come up with their own sort of customized solutions to those challenges. And granted, it doesn't, you know, it's not easy and we rarely have enough resources to stick with it. I mean, right now we're up to like at least three year commitments at a time. That's as much money as I can, you know, can commit at any moment, but it, but it allows us to get full time staff at an organization and really work with them hand in hand to carry out uh, interventions. And so in, in this example with, with open streets and open restaurants, not only can we go to those, those organizations to really help um, you know, amplify what the city's saying about a new program that's out, but we can also, you know, rely on them and sort of pivot that money or sort of help them sort of reallocate money that we're already giving them to a program that is reacting sort of the current environment. Um, and then the final thing I touch in is also, you know, our agency being very, you know, very much focused on, on equity of opportunity. Um, you know, we, we ourselves are taking on, um, looking at that map I showed about participation rates really 
cold calling at this point. Like literally, I think we, we laid out a, a list of 5,000 restaurants based on those neighborhoods that had the lowest participation rate. And we have a team of 10 people, I think they're starting actually today or tomorrow, to literally call restaurants and, and find out why are you not participating? Um, you know, what, you know, is it access? Is it, do you not know about the program and how can we help you do it and comply? And so, you know, we're trying a couple of different tactics, but, uh, but hopefully that at least helps move the needle in some of those neighborhoods that really need additional help. Thank you very much. Now I've got a terrible dilemma because we're supposed to finish in about three minutes and there's about five really good questions and we're not going to fit them all in. I'm going to make uh, the chair's judgment of, of overrunning a little bit because Lee has given me uh, permission to be able to do that earlier on. Um, and, but I, I just, I'm going to, uh, there's some questions which I think I'm just going to address to one of you at a time rather than every one of you. And apologies in advance for those questions I'm not going to get in. What I would suggest is that we type these questions up and, and if you will indulge me panel members, we can pass them and we can actually just do an answer and, and put it out there because they're, they're interesting questions. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions is about the role of city government. What was going through my mind is I think of city, a good city should be like a really good orchestra everybody plays you know their part and they come together well because there is a conductor and you know one of my questions was going to be who's going to be the conductor one one questioner richard cobb says um if this is the role of city government um is there enough creative creative thinking present in local um, city government and if not how would we stimulate that so that's a question for you tim i think you're nodding well, I, thanks, Pat. And I think um, that's got to be something about community participation. And um, I, I think the better the conversation, the better the quality of creativity in the in the um, governing organisation. Having that open conversation, whether it's cold calling, brilliant, whether it's a digital online platform where people can log things in, it's about doing things not just at this crisis, but keeping it going. I think some of the best schemes that are most likely to be working right now are the ones that were already on the boil before the coronavirus they were coming through and they've just been accelerated and i can see in the other questions there there's something about well you know what should stay what should go how do we know what to keep what lessons have been learned i think right now we have to do things with a real light touch and celebrate experimentation and be prepared to change and if we've got a something that's not working, it's channeling too much global movement and lo not letting people cross the road, as in Esther's question, let's break the barriers apart and let's people let people cross, monitor it for a week. If everything's moving nice and slowly, then the chances are we can afford to take a few risks. Great, thank you very much. And that's one of the things we're not terribly good at is iteration. You know, the tactical urbanism that New York did with those experiments, I think, yeah. It's, it's, it's such a good thing for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask this one to you. I'm going to ask it to Jeff, but it's about um, how do we see the role of data in the future to help create better community driven neighborhoods? I suppose I'm asking, uh, I'm asking the, the wrong person because you would say yes, wouldn't you? How, what, what do you think about how do we get data into the hands of communities, Jeff? Well, I think the key is here is that, uh, you know, we, we, have a really good idea about what problem we're trying to solve and then what data we need to collect to solve it. I think right now there's a tendency to collect data just because we can and then we get drowned in it um, because we don't know how it's really hard to work with and we haven't you know planned ahead of time about how it's going to be applied. So I think a lot of cases less data might be better. Um, I think data that can help us connect with, you know, some of the community member needs, revealing certain behaviors, understanding, sort of raising folks' awareness of like, you know, the hero of the shop, uh, the corner shop owner or whatever it might be. So using data to reveal some things that might not be seen, using data to really pinpoint uh, particular questions, and then thinking very much about data as a as an iteration tool, um, so that we're you know testing and monitoring the impact over time. I think I would much rather go in that direction than just getting more of it. 
Great, thank you. And, and Blaise, I'd like to bring you in on this. I'm thinking particularly about your neighbourhood 360s. You know, you're big on data, aren't you? Well, we, I've, we've tried to be because I think we were starting from, uh, well, at least, let's say six, seven years ago, you know, at a place where we felt like a lot of our community-based partners weren't looking at it at, at all. And I'd be exaggerating slightly there, but I think our hope was, yes, to at least ensure we could measure our impact over time if we were going to make such substantial investments. So, we, yeah, we did, um, you know, do, you know, work with our uh, partners to really collect primary research and data in the field, kind of teaching them and, and leveraging them, but then also kind of marrying that data with sort of what the city had access to and, and other sort of proprietary data sources so we could look at some patterns and help, you know, help sort of marry the local with sort of some of the sort of city expertise that we had and ensure that we were um, kind of collaborating on, on the strategy that uh, we wanted to pursue for a place. But I, I mean, I think uh, to Jeff's point, I think I mean, what we found and do we have, you know, our uh, neighborhood challenge program was also about this idea of helping our community based partners um, use data and technology and uh, in a way that helped them sort of improve their operations and, and sort of be thoughtful, given sort of limited resources about how they directed uh, resources. And I think, I mean, what we've, I think just that, that sort of uh, data literacy and the understanding of how to use data and, and how to make sort of decisions from it is is a real, you know, there's a steep learning curve there we found. And so I think, I think we would also shy away from like overwhelming people with data and finding sort of some key data points that help really inform their strategy. Great, thank you very much. And then um, one last full question is um, from the founder of the London International Festival of Theatre, co-founder Lucy Neal. Um, to you, Stella, the last year has seen major protest movements taking, our, taking to our streets youth climate strikes, XR, Black Lives Matter. How do you think these activist gatherings change and charge the stories of our streets, linking the global and the local? You're on mute. Oh, I still haven't learned. Um, it's a really, that's a really interesting question and I have a, a kind of long answer that is also a dissertation and a kind of short answer that is about you know, that's exactly where those protests and the, 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 the moments of gathering in local spaces outside um, has a huge history in itself. It is, it's, a, it's a feature of protest um, for, uh, you know, when we talk, we even name protests after the places where they took place, the streets, the corners, we, mem we put memorials in those places. And that's exactly, I think, the thing that has been missing in our localities for a long time, you know, dominated by commercial units and restaurants and all of these other spaces. There has to be room for the social responses to the spaces where, where, where people live and where people gather. And one of the other things that it does is it makes, um, I, I think this, this definitely started in the early days of Anonymous, the kind of sense that activity was taking place in the social space, but it was mapping itself locally and internationally, so that you would get um, you would get anonymous groups named after again different locations, and that was how even the network community uh, the, the network communicate communication was happening amongst all of those groups, and so I think there is a real kind of hyper localness to that where people can gather to congregate, um, a bit like what we have with kind of Speaker's Corner and how that kind of spreads out. How we reclaim the spaces and the narratives of who is in those spaces, which is also a really impor important um, vocal thread in all of that protest and how it links to location, but also that we're linking people, communities and those spaces internationally. The sense of sol solidarity with a place like Brixton and a city in Brazil and a city in, you know, another space in the global south, there is a shortcut to a sense of identity and therefore a narrative story that can be created and shared and passed on that makes the streets a powerful place and a powerful symbol. Brilliant, thank you so much. I apologise to Will Sandy and to Esther Curlin that we haven't done their questions justice, but um, we could carry on with this really rich
conversation, but sadly we can't, because I'm now going to have to say thank you to our fantastic speakers for all your wonderful contributions. I've, I've learned a lot and it's reinforced all sorts of things that I want to take away as part of London 3.0 and my work in general. Um, and that's what this is all about, is actually informing our next steps in order to make these community driven places um, uh, for, that will, will resonate for the rest of our lives. So um, I'd now like to say thank you properly to the audience and to you, our speakers, and hand over back to Movers and Shakers, Chief Executive, Executive Director Lee Natasha Salter. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Pat. What a fantastic panel. You know, I've absolutely loved today's debate, and I know we could have easily gone on another hour or more. And, you know, immensely talented pa panel and it's the passion and I think you know it what I actually found quite amazing I have to highlight is how you could marry the quantifying this hard data the modeling with kind of the qualitative with you know creativity with linking communities with culture things that are so difficult sometimes to really define but we can use technology and we can use kind of digital to get the community involved to get community balloting for example to get you know you can get the community onto council meetings now you can go on to zoom and you know watch these great cultural experiences that organizations like lift are organizing so it does increase you know the connectivity uh, with your community with you know in terms of accessibility but you know i think the real estate industry which is sort of what we were working in, in movers and shakers and our members etc really need to take some responsibility you know the built environment has to really take all of these elements on board to start really thinking local before building up like you say to that city level i know it's absolutely fascinating completely enlightening and we will be as pat said moving forward with a city level event we're also going to do one on leadership which is absolutely paramount that we look from the ground up and obviously the top down as well and we somehow balance the two but really looking forward to that and we do absolutely thank our panel today and I know that we'll involve you all in more of our events because I think it's really important and it's great to get the international perspective so thank you so much to you all thank you to our viewers today and just a very quickly note our next event is on Wednesday the 22nd it's our final in the three um, series for build to rent which is on co-locations and next generation so it's going to be brilliant so please do go on our website and do apply to join for that one and thank you so much for watching today we hope you enjoyed it do still keep safe from our family to yours thank you